Welcome back on the Smith Family Show today. We've met already Elaine Smith and now a good mate of mine, a good friend of yours, obviously, because I get more mail about this bloke than anybody else who's a regular on the show. The Reverend John Smith. <laughs> It's true. Whenever you're on the show, uh, immediately we're fired up with phone calls and people writing, particularly, I notice from mothers, mothers of mm. teenage children, because for those of you who are not aware of John Smith, he's a minister of religion, he's the, the chaplain of God Squad, does a lot of work in all areas, but particularly with, with young people. But it might be interesting today, John, because in the past we've covered that sort of territory mm. somewhat, to find out something about you and not necessarily what got you into the ministry, but that would be interesting, I'm sure, but also what got you into this particular area of work. Your dad was a minister, wasn't he? Yeah, wonderful man. He's 75 now and still very sharp, still open for good debate, can still give me a run for my money. A conservative Methodist minister, I would yes. imagine. Well, strange. Radical in some things, conservative in others. Probably very conservative in theory, but very radically into caring for people, and his whole life's been given to people and to his faith. Nothing else. Nothing else has ever mattered to him. I don't think he's ever been to a movie, although I love the shows and the movies, but Dad's just totally given himself in an old world way and he's a wonderful man. Was it inevitable, John, that you'd be a minister yourself? I would have thought that no. kids of, uh, children of, of ministers, quite often they, they rebel against that. I think it's probably inevitable that I'd be a driven person because, you know, 1% of everybody in the who's who book of Australian top people are the sons and daughters of Protestant ministers. There's a driven thing about it, I think, when you grow up there, but no, I was an atheist, actually, when I was uh, 19, lost my faith and never thought I'd find my way back, so it wasn't inevitable. I was a school teacher then. Well, how did that faith come back to you? Well, like everything else for me, I guess, in, with a lot of pain, struggle and, and drama, I guess it, it was partly an intellectual thing that if there was no meaning behind the universe, my very lonely inner struggles as a kid didn't seem to be able to find any resolution. So I guess part of the reason I'm in youth work and will probably stay there all the days of my life is that I know what it is to be 16, slam the door, feel mum and dad and nobody loves me, despite the fact they're all doing their level best to communicate. So I think the communication and the love thing was born out of pain rather than success. But why did you have that lonely struggle as a kid? Because I know your, your parents were good people and warm people mm. and caring people. Was it simply because it was a very hard act to follow with your dad being a minister? That certainly was a problem and you know that the children of actresses and actors and parliamentarians have really the same problem. Leaders' kids do have that struggle. I didn't feel Dad could understand how weak I felt and how frightened I was and how much the demand was to perform, even in the manse. So, yes, there was an element of that in it, I think. How did you find God Squad, or how did it find you? It started with some guys, actually, before me who didn't have quite the same structured worldview or theological background, and the Melbourne God Squad has taken on a shape that I guess has reflected a lot of my worldview. But they were just great guys in Sydney who came out of the bike scene and who said, look, our mates in there have got no one who cares a hoot about them. They're lonely people. Why don't we get out there and uh, see what we can do to make relationship, uh, get through the conflict and begin to give them some worldview that would give a, a foundation for hope and for meaning in life. So I became more or less a chaplain to them to start off with. And they were actually named initially after the old Mod Squad. Mm -hmm. Remember the, yes. uh, the hippie days? Yep. And uh, they saw the show and one day said Mod Squad. Why don't we call it God Squad? And then from that it grew to a much broader uh, kind of work like we developed down here in Melbourne. They sort of gave us the clear to go ahead and make our own shape and that's the shape that the media and the people in general have got to know. John, in your early 30s, you dropped out again. <laughs> yes, I guess I did. I was very straight then. Um, uh, matter of fact, uh, you'd hardly believe what I was like before the hippie movement came along, listening to somebody that used to be in here. Look at that. That's John Smith. Well, that's just the beginning. See, that's when I first grew my beard and I still look sort of twinkly and a bit clean, you know. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get into the hippie thing a bit and... Uh, what happened then? Well, uh, a lot of very kind people that were in that kind of world took me on and gave me a chance, gave me a chance to prove that my compassion was real and wasn't just a stage show to make something for my own ego. The door opened up and those people came alongside of me and we were able to trade. They traded me the culture and understanding of the youth culture and understanding of the things that were tearing kids apart 
in the old Vietnam days, and I gave them something of a world view and a shape to begin to find, something to live for and to structure their lives on. John, would I just have a look at the book, please? That's the second one. Yeah. Bert, I didn't have a copy of On the Side of the Angels, well, unfortunately. No, Advance Australia Where, though, I, I, I think is a, a fascinating book, simply because I, I've never read a book before where an ordained minister and social worker has really basically told a country that where they're going wrong and what they need to do to try to put the brakes on. Because if the brakes aren't put on, your belief is that we haven't got much future. Yes, that's right. I think the problem is too, Bert, you, that show you had, I was on holidays and was able to watch you for days and a few soapies to see what goes on. I don't usually get time. But when I watched you that week when you took on the Salvos, that was a wonderful show, I felt, and a very great tribute from this show and from you to do something a little bit different and to state something good to the nation. But there is one weakness, and that is it's easy to get money to support people when they're in a total mess at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But unless we educate a generation in conflict resolution, unless we can work through our, our loss of a sense of self-worth, get our eyes beyond ourselves, we haven't seen anything yet. I'm frightened for what 10 years down the line will mean. When you can get an ad on telly where they sell a heavy metal record by saying, buy it, your mother will hate it, you have an, an yeah. extraordinary thing happening in our culture. Well, in America, I mean, just recently, it, it's been declared that they're going to they're going to lose a generation, ha mm. not happily, but they're going to say, well, that's a generation that we can just forget about because we've lost them. But how can you do that? Because exactly. they're the parents of the exactly. one that follows. That means you give up civilization, not just a generation. So what do we do? Well, I'm trying to do what I can. I think. One of the things that gets me into trouble, even with my own people, is the fact that I'm riding so many camels at once. To use your uh, image. The, the, I do or, all things rather than just or ride try to ride <laughs> exactly. more than one that's, camel at once. That's closer to but it. But I think the, the problem, Bert, is that these days in specialisation, the different things don't touch each other. The gut level people at the bottom of the street aren't doing the cerebral thinking. The cerebral thinkers come up with great ideas but are out of touch with the heart of the people. Mm. So we are trying in our organisation, all of us, and myself in particular, to try and bridge right across so that the first book. 16-year-olds can read, and I'm about to write another one which a big American company has commissioned me to go ahead with where I'm going to do stuff for teenagers about rock music, about parental conflicts, about sexuality, do the lot. That'll be very easy to read, but that book could be read by a university student. In fact, uh, Professor Manning Clark has given an OK to it mm -hmm. as an almost agnostic. And that's an argument for a religious view of life, but in secular words, that's more intellectual because we try to go right across the board and bring together all those things. We used to call it layman's language, and that's yes. exactly what it's written in. Yeah. John, I'll prepare myself now over the weekend, well, not this weekend, obviously the weekend after next, to start uh, answering the mail that will come in. They can write to your care of me, and perhaps sure. you'd like to answer some of the And we've the followed some of those up and Certainly. had some very wonderful responses to it. Good luck to you, John. Bless you. The Reverend John Smith. <laughs>